AT&T were on the other side of the road. We were the first company, we were the first business out there. When we moved out there, there was no water and there was no sewer out there. And we got grant money and made all that happen. And the business has kind of followed us since. When we moved out there, the last stoplight was at Lowe's. And once you got past Cokie Mill, you could drive 55 miles an hour all the way out there. So it was pretty rural out there at the time. I was asked to provide you guys with some advice as to what to do if you're pursuing human resources. And uh, I think if you, how many of you in here are actually think you might want to do this, uh, be in human resources? Raise your hand high so I can see you. Okay, that's good. Um, I think it's a good field. I think, I think it's growing. I think there's opportunities. It's going to change just like so many other jobs uh, going forward. Things are going to change just faster and faster, but uh, one thing you need to learn about is to kind of learn a bit about the business model that you think you might be interested in. In other words, if you are going to work, if you'd like to work in not-for-profits, um, try and learn a little bit about that while you're in college. Volunteer, get an internship there. If you think you'd like to go into the medical field or something like that, then try and make some connections, try and talk with those people. Learn a little bit about that field and what it entails, some of the ups, some of the downs, some of the tricks of the trade, and, and try and befriend some folks within that, uh, that area. Um, if you're going to go into something like manufacturing, like what I'm doing, try and learn a little bit about that. Maybe you can take some classes on, on business or quality or some things like that that might kind of sift over. So I would encourage you to look at the other side. For those of you that are taking this as an elective or because you have to or some other reason, um, I would tell you to try and uh, be able to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and figure out what it is that those people have to do. Um, in a lot of organizations, human resources is a, is a tough job because more often than not, I'm, I'm the person that has to say no. I'm the person that has to tell people they can't do things. You can't have the day off. You've had too much time. You can't work here anymore. This is your last day. And that's, uh, that's an ugly piece of business. I was at a conference one time, and the speaker asked the audience, he said, how many people have ever had to lay off more than 50 people in one day? And most of the people raised their hand, and he said, that's an ugly day, isn't it? And it is to have to tell people that either you're getting laid off or you're getting fired, you don't work here anymore. I had a labor attorney once tell me, he said, in labor law, you're like the uh, judge, jury, and executioner, and you get to put people to death. That's essentially what you're doing when you tell them they don't work here anymore. Because your job, when you get into the workplace, is pretty much who you're all about. So it can be a, a big responsibility. I'm checking my notes now. Uh, tonight I was going to talk a little bit about performance reviews. You guys are as excited as all the managers in my organization about performance reviews. Um, I think this is kind of a niche, and I think you guys could get some mileage out of this. I know you're going to hear some other people talk, but I have, uh, I have some video and a couple other things. This is something that's done um, exceedingly poor in most organizations, and even in good organizations. Most of the time, frontline managers are the ones that are doing the performance reviews. And they view that as a rather loathsome task, something that they have to do, they're made to do, and that they don't want to do. But they don't really understand it as a tool. And if they were to step back and look at uh, the benefits that can be had from that, I think that they would really um, maybe get a better understanding of that. But they get so caught up in just not wanting to do that or boo-hooing and belly aching about it, that it just becomes a, an ugly piece of business. So if you could come into an organization uh, and help them really move that forward, I think that would really, really put you in a good position with uh, the powers that be within the organization. Uh, 
Um, these are just my notes. I'm just going to kind of look at here. I've got a couple of videos. Performance management really is kind of part of overall compensation, uh, recognition, and all of the other things that, that go along with dental organization. And uh, most employees are okay to good. There's some that are really bad. There's the, 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 the 20 10 rule. You know, 20% of your people are on the outliers. The 10% here that are really great, the 10% that are really horrible. But by and large, we're using a um, uh, one to five rating scale on things. Uh, I believe what that refers to is a, a Likert scale, one to five. And it's um, most people end up three and four to substandard. One is one that you got about two feet out the door, and you're just slamming behind you. And fives, most supervisors are not comfortable giving a five because if you give a five to somebody, what more can they do for you? That's it. You're telling them that they're as good as it gets. So um, people tend to want to shy away from that. I had a guy that had perfect attendance. And I had a supervisor give him a four on his attendance. And I said, Jesus Christ, what do you got to do? He said, he never missed any days. You give him a four? Oh, maybe I should give him a five. It's a Good thinking, good thinking. I don't know what else an employee could do. I mean, I don't know, just live there. Um, this, uh, this component of, of HR and uh, performance management, a lot of this I see as kind of defensive HR. A lot of people see it that way. Um, you guys know what defensive medicine is? Yes, no? When you go to a doctor, typically they don't tell you what you have, they tell you what you don't have. If you go in the emergency room, you know, typically the first couple of things they're going to check you for is a heart attack or a stroke. Then they're going to look for some other things that might make you die right there in the emergency room. And then they start knocking them off. You don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this. Well, a lot of people practice HR that way. You know, I've got all my ducks in a row to defend against litigation or anything like that. And all the while, you're not really moving the ball forward. You're just kind of, you know the term for this, covering your rear end there. Um, so I think there's a lot of that that goes on. I think if somebody's really forward thinking, like this gentleman here I'm going to show you, maybe, if I can get it started, he has some thoughts on, on it, and uh, I think he has a lot to say here. Okay, last participation time now. I gave you guys some donuts. Who did, what did that mean to somebody? What did you get out of that? What was he saying? 
You're a smart guy. Tell me, what did he say to you there? Basically that uh, within performance management, it's, it's more, mm -hmm. you can't just, you sort of have to get a broad, a broad picture. You can't just focus on one or two elements. Like, there's more than, than just uh, the, the nitpicky things, so to speak. I think he was speaking a lot to what I call checkbox management, and he was talking about business metrics. but. Was there something else that's, that, that somebody else over here on the other side of the room got out of that? that uh, what, what was he saying that where opportunities lie? Sir? Opportunity lies at, lies at the, the uh, review itself. How the manager does his reviews, if he does, if he does takes it like at, 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 at a check mark, check mark management, he's not getting the full effect of, of what the review is. He wants this guy to see how he can improve to improve his job perform performance, but if the guy says, check, oh, you're satisfactory here, you're satisfactory here, you're satisfactory here, what's he telling him? It's you're doing things, okay. you're yeah. not doing things, what, you're not stepping up. You're, he's doing absolutely nothing to develop that employee, he's just telling him where he's at, and it's like um, some of the tactics in here, we'll, we'll, we'll go over them here in the PowerPoint, but there, there's management by objective or other things that you can do when you're going through these reviews and trying to, to help develop your employee, telling them what they need, what the organization needs from them, and how you can make them better, and how the organization can make them better. By doing so, you're going to make them more marketable, and you're going to make them more of an asset to you. So, you know, if, if you treat them well, they stick around, then they're going to help the organization grow. If they decide to leave at some point, and all employees will leave sooner or later, you know, whether you die on the job or whether you take another job, but you're going to have done them a favor and have developed them along the way. So I think from where I sit, that's a good thing for people. I think that when you can engage and develop people, if people come in our organization and they leave and they're better, I feel good about that. Those are some of the things that help me sleep good at night, knowing that I'm taking care of the people that are within our organization. So I think what he, he had to say there, um, I think it speaks to, to me and what, what we're trying to do here. Um, learn a little bit about performance management. Had you guys, were you familiar with this at all before this chapter? Have you touched on this a little bit? No? Any of you guys ever had a performance review yourself? I had lots of them. How'd they go? Uh, some good, some bad. <laughs> and it was based largely on the person delivering the performance review? It, it, it is, a lot of it. If you have a personality conflict with the given person giving you a performance review, you generally can count, you're not going to get a very good performance review, but if you got one with you got a good rapport with, and you can, you can bounce ideas off them to improve, improve yourself and improve the organization, Generally, you get a better performance review because you're thinking ahead and you're thinking outside the box, which is what a lot of managers want you to do. I think that's true, and I've seen that even with, uh, I look at reviews that are done, and I'll see ones that different managers do, and I'll see one where, you know, we've had a guy that's worked with three different supervisors, and two of them think the guy's great, one of them thinks he's terrible, and so I'm looking at this going, okay, what's wrong with this picture? Does this guy got an ax to grind for, for this individual? What, what's up with that? Because how can he be a great employee? He's a great employee, and all of a sudden he's just, just no good. So I think you're exactly right. That can really kind of impact things. I had a boss one time. He did a two pieces statistic each. When he looked at performance reviews, if he saw a bad one, he looked at the two previous ones. And the two previous ones were were 4.5s, 5s, somewhere in there, and the sixth, last one was a 3. He knew he had a personality complex, so he generally just threw that one out and he could go base his decisions on the previous two. A lot, of, a lot of supervisors are afraid to give good scores because, you know, if, if an employee does something bad and then you think you want to bounce them out the door and you've been giving them good reviews, it's kind of hard to do that from... from you know, from where I sit, I think that's probably a good thing, and employees need to understand that. If, you know, our, 
our shop is a union shop, so I have to deal with the hierarchy and union people in there. And I honestly believe that the unions make people better, better HR people. Because you gotta do all your documentation, you gotta do it properly, and you gotta dot all your I's and cross all your T's. Well, when we have an employee, and, and we had one that's been a great employee for 15 or 16 years, and then all of a sudden something happens, and I've been doing this long enough to know it's probably uh, something outside work that's going on that's impacting their life, and so their performance just goes, you know, falls off of nothing. They start missing time, they show up late, they're doing a poor job at work. Well, something's going on in that person's life, and you can't just toss them on the heap because I think after 15 years of their life, you need to look at what they've done for over the last 15 years and then try and give them some help. Now, I'll throw them a line, and if they want to, if they don't want to reach out and grab it, then so be it. But we have an employee assistance program that, you know, we can refer them to. We can talk to them about what's going on in their life. You know, we've had people sometimes they'll have a drinking problem, they'll have a family, a family problem with a spouse or a child, or they've got bill problems or something else. And that stuff all spills over into the workplace. But if you've got a good, good history of employee reviews and you're doing a great job, then if somebody has a lick of compassion, hopefully they're going to see that and, and, and try and help you out. And I would counsel all of you folks to look at it that way as well because people don't just, they don't just deviate. Their performance tends to, you know, kind of goes down the line here. It's up and down, it's up and down, and up and down. But when you get a really dramatic shift in that, something else is going on in somebody you have an ounce of compassion in your soul, you should look to, to deal with that. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. You guys use SlideShare at all? You ever go on SlideShare? You ever heard of SlideShare? Who's heard of SlideShare? Raise your hand. Really? SlideShare is a place on the internet where people share their uh, presentations and stuff. <laughs> so if you're ever looking to do a presentation, say like on performance management or something, you might want to go to the internet and look on, on a SlideShare and see what's out there. Um, I took the liberty to use one that the, uh, a guy, a friend of mine on Twitter, speaking of Twitter, speaking of Twitter, made myself a note. I'm talking to somebody in the room. Do you know, who knows who I'm talking to now? I tweeted out before I came here. I was coming to the class tonight to talk. There's your prize. I said the first one to respond to me and follow back would get a, uh, a prize. Oh wait, I don't hear the oohs and the ahs. <laughs> um, enjoy that. I hope, hope that's fun for you. So I, I was looking around as to what to do, and I, I thought I'd just go to SlideShare and see what uh, was out there. And I went through this one presentation, and uh, another gentleman I know on Twitter did this, <clears throat> but it's pretty good. You'll see these things. You can search SlideShare, and it's a social application. You can follow people. They can follow you. People put up their presentations on SlideShare, and they're kind of saying, here, this is what I did. I'm proud of it. It's good stuff. So this guy calls his business Jumpstart HR, and uh, I, I'm not sure I can pronounce his first name. I, I see him on Twitter all the time. I'm guessing he's from India, um, or at least his family is. But uh, it's a pretty good deck he put up there. And I'm just going to kind of run through this here. This is what you can expect from the deck. I'm not going to read that to you. He's got a pretty good definition of uh, performance management here. Why don't you guys read that rather than me reading it to you? Got 
there. Okay. These are the elements of the performance management system. It starts even before they come in the door. Pre-employment interview. Um, you know, there's a there's a big concern about the way that employers are treating prospective employees these days. And I think I, I am part of the problem rather than part of the solution. <clears throat> but as a prospective employee, our, our relationship starts, you know, the minute that you begin to interact with our company. Whether that's an application or whether that's a phone call to our organization, um, you're starting to get vibes and feelings about the way that you're going to be treated or about the way that that organization works. And the economy's been in the doldrums really for a number of years now. And so what's happened is there are more employees than jobs out there. So the theory goes like this, that we employers have been treating prospective employees badly. And we don't treat them with respect, the courtesy, the dignity that we should, because there's more of you than there is jobs to go around. So I'll just, I'll just cherry pick the, the best prospective employees, and the hell with the rest of you. And I'm not going to respond to your calls, I'm not going to answer your letters, um, so on and so forth. I don't like to be treated like that. Hell, I, I go into tirades if people don't answer my emails. Um, so that's the theory. And so here again, understand that that's where the employment relationship begins. It's when you first, you, the first interaction you have with the company. So then you get hired, and you're going to come, and you're going to go through the employee orientation. Maybe you're going to get uh, some objectives put forth to you. You're going to get some documentation, whether it's a handbook. Uh, and then hopefully you're going to get some feedback. I think in a reasonably good organization, you're going to get some type of appraisal. It may not be formal or documented. But, you know, your boss is going to tell you whether you're doing a good job, whether you're not doing a good job, what you need to pick up on. And if you're in a little higher functioning organization, you may get some sort of development plan. Um, you may have some alternatives for compensation and promotion decisions, and maybe even be involved in some type of succession planning. Are these terms that are all in your vocabulary, boys and girls? Yes? No? Hold up one finger for yes. Yes. Roles and responsibility. Um, I think this walk the talk is uh, this, this gentleman here was talking about this. You know, your boss, your supervisor, they got to be genuine. They have to, if, if they're laying down things for you to do, they have to do that as well. They have to perform at the same level they want you to perform at, and they have to do all the things that you want them to do and more. And then you need to recognize and reward the people that are doing that. And you know, recognition is a, is, a, is a very important thing. It doesn't have to be outrageous or over the top or anything like that, but there's an old line I heard years ago, and since I'm such an old guy, it was a long time ago. Um, it's praise in public, punish in private. You ever heard of that? And so what that means is if somebody does a good job and we're in the office setting, you know, if you handled an irate customer on the phone, you know, if I walk up to you and go, man, you handled that great, that was fabulous. Now, conversely, had you uh, dropped the ball and I said, can we step outside for a second? I'm going to talk to you. And then I would berate you, you know, just boom, boom, boom. But you don't do that in front of people because that really, really... I have to tell you you did a good job ten times to make up for the one time that I told you that you were a bonehead, especially if you do that in front of everybody. There's an old book, it was my favorite book actually, Dr. Covey, Stephen Covey. He calls that people's emotional bank accounts. And you have to make uh, ten deposits for every one withdrawal that you make. So you need, you need to be telling people that. Now it doesn't have to be great or anything, but just, you know, Somebody's done a good job, just let them know. They will appreciate that. Managers and supervisors, of course, are, gonna, are the people that are making this, this work. They've got to implement 
they've got to sustain the systems. HR should put those in place. And then communication is key because all of this stuff hinges on communication. Communicating with the employee, communicating with the department managers, communicating inside the company, so on and so forth. And for employees to understand it, they need to have good communication, and then you want them to operate within your system, because if they don't, then we'll be stepping outside and having that conversation. A committee, you can do that if you have a large enough organization, but uh, you need to train people, they need to know the systems you're using. There are, I looked, and I'm not gonna show you, but you can look, uh, online, there are probably two, three hundred products out there in terms of software that businesses can use today as uh, performance management tools um, that, that help facilitate that. Some of them are complex and expensive, some of them are not so complex and a little less expensive, but there's all kinds of tools over there that will help you manage employees and employee performance. Okay, this is the big stuff here. Have you guys talked about this at all? Types of performance management? No. Um, I would say this is a pretty comprehensive list of the types of ones that are out there right now. Um, a ranking is uh, is literally where you. If you had 30 employees, <coughs> you would say that who's the best employee? That's Bob. He's number one. Who's the worst employee? That's Susie. She's number 30. And then you're going to rank them all the way up and down the line. And while some might argue it's a, it's a good practice to be able to have a list of employees and who's, who's at the top of the list and who's at the bottom of the list, um, there is quite a bit of rancor around this, and it's been probably four or five years ago. The guy who was president of General Electric, Jack Welch, I'm moving around so you can't follow me. Uh, Jack Welch, anybody ever heard of him? He had a system where within General Electric, what he wanted to do in every department was the top or the bottom 10% of every employee each year shown the door that he wanted the top performers there so they would move them out they ended up having quite a bit of litigation over that and ultimately ended up ceasing that practice um, it wasn't quite as harsh as it sounds but it was still kind of draconian oftentimes GE was a big company so if you were if you worked in a manufacturing division and you were a production floor supervisor, they might try and move you into another organization. That if you weren't very good as a supervisor, maybe you'd be good as a line worker, or maybe you'd be good in a call center or something like that. But they were moving you out of that job. And you know, it creates kind of a, a, a paranoid atmosphere too, because you're all looking around, am I, be am I better than you? Are you better than me? Are we gonna, what am I gonna do to make myself better than you? Because I don't wanna be the one showing the door. So. Some people like that kind of environment. I personally don't think that it's a good thing. And you guys can figure that out for yourself. I referee hockey, just something I do. So that means uh, I do that in my free time.